talk about maps. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, now, I want to start with a disclaimer. I'm talking about maps, but I'm not a geographer, I'm not a historian, and I'm not a politician. So if I get anything wrong or say anything that sounds a bit um, offensive, I really don't mean any offense, so I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee once said that the original idea for the, of the web was that it should be a collaborative space where you can communicate through sharing information. And um, that's kind of why I'm here. I'm a developer a person who makes a very small part of the web, um, who stumbled down the rabbit hole um, into the world of maps. Um, now, I, when I submitted this, I said that I was going to extend on an article I wrote for 24 ways, um, and it was going to be all practical and tell you how to do lots of things. But actually, I, the more I wrote, the more I found that I just like looking at maps. So this is basically an atlas. Um, so I'm tr just trying to focus on exploring the bigger picture of maps on the web instead of the actual practical. Now, Google seems to have a monopoly over maps. Um, you probably all like, just put on a Google map, and that's fine, but it's not the only solution. Um, and I can understand why. I mean, they're extremely quick and simple, and they're accurate and easy to use. Um, and they're nice to look at, aren't they? Um, so I'm kind of here to introduce you to you an entire com compendium of techniques, um, which you might not really need, but I think it's really good to um, inspire like, and show that there are other ways of doing things. So hopefully um, you find it useful. Um, and if you just want to use a Google map, I won't think any of anything less of you. Um, but you can use Helvetica or Arial for your fonts, or stock images for your photos. This, this echo is weird. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the lovely blue and purple um, color scheme for links. But that is a bit boring. And I mean, they look, do look nice, but like, when was the last time you went without CSS? I mean, it's just not something you do. But we do all just put Google Maps on. Um, and I mean, you can still use Google Maps, but they can be styled and fit in with the branding and stuff like that. Um, so I'm sure the majority of people in the audience have um, spent countless amount of hours working on typography and um, like getting your margins and white space correct and making sure the colors match up with your brand. And maybe even like Google tested, what, 49, something like that, different colors of blue. Um, but we all just use the same maps, and it is a bit boring. So um, yeah, I, I think we can do better. Now, I'm not saying you need to build a custom map for everything you do. Um, you don't need to like, spend a year making a map for a coffee shop. That's just not needed. But you do, um, I think it's valuable to know your options and um, like, to inspire you to do something a bit interesting. So I'm going to go through a different, I will go through some techniques um, to kind of look at how. Um, to change the color palettes, or even uh, there's one bit where we do a real-time um, visualization of earthquakes, which should be quite interesting, I hope. I'm not doing any live coding. I was going to, but I, like, it will go wrong if I try that. Now, this is the first map. It, it, it's a bit blurred there, but um, Alice in Wonderland, obviously. Um, but is it a map? Or what is a map? Um, so w when do lines and dots become a picture or just a mess? Um, that's kind of what I've been thinking about lately. And I really love this quote by T.S. Uh, no, not by T.S. Spirit, by <laughs> Ray Flarsen in his novel, The Selected Works of T.S. Spirit. A map does not just chart, it, unlo in, it unlocks and formulates meaning. It forms bridges between here and there, between disparate ideas that we did not know were previously connected. Like, I, I could literally spend a very long time thinking about that quote. I read it about a year ago, and it's one of the only quotes that I know off by heart. Um, and just the phrase, disparate ideas, conjures up a multitude of ideas. Um, but it's unlocks and formulates meaning, that's the important part. Um, I won't get into various interpretations of the quote, but um, I think the difference between a map and a picture is, um, well, as it says here, the context between the lines and the dots, the meaning within. Or the unlocked meaning within, as I wrote here. 
Now, this is the London Squared map uh, by After the Flood. Um, I saw a presentation by the team that did it, and when I first watched it, I didn't think it was a presentation. Uh, not a presentation, I didn't think it was a map. But actually, um, you can really see that the context comes from like, road labels and icons, and you can see um, the Thames through London. It, it really does show that um, if you've got the context, then that makes it a map. Um, I don't know how well you know London, but most people can, from London can kind of tell where um, the regions are. Now, I've always been a bit of a bookworm, and I've recently had my nose in all of the atlases and cartography books. Um, and this one's my favorite. It's called Cartographer. Um, and it's done by the United States Library of Congress. And it's just, it's like, it's not very thick, but every page um, is just insanely beautiful and really nice. So I find it quite interesting. This, this is 1947, so this isn't one of the historical maps. It's just one that's within copyright, so I don't have to worry about that. But um, it's quite interesting how, um, when you look over time at maps, um, it, they knew far less of the geography of the Earth. Um, so it was more their context was working out where the rivers were, that kind of thing. But now we take road maps and even GPS for granted. But it's only relatively recently that maps have included um, roads at all. Um, this is one of Bologna. Um, while, while the roads um, dating back to about 1160 BC, which um, is a long time ago, um, they weren't common. You had to like, be the richest person on Earth, basically, to have one. Um, and it wasn't until about 1572 that they released, um, and between 15, um, 1572 and 1618 AD, that um, six volumes of... Now, I should point out that I'm not very good at speaking English, let alone any other language, but here's a go at Latin. Um, Civitas Orbis Terrarium, um, that's a book, and I really, I wish I could get the original, but it's cost a fortune. Um, but it was published, and it was filled of town plans from all over the world. And I'm sorry about all the history, I just find it really interesting, and um, looking at the old maps makes me think of how we can do the new ones. So... Um, Long ago, back in circa 500 BC, um, Hecateus of Miletus, yes, was far more concerned with understanding the world. Um, like I said, what shape is it? Um, it, you sh it shows round here with Libya as a continent, which is a bit odd. Um, so uh, this is um, Anaximander's map, which Hecateus based his on. Um, Hecateus is on the next slide. Um, but his map was called The World According to Hecateus, um, and there's, it, was lost, it was years ago, so it was, um, there's reconstructions, because they, they weren't able to print maps because of how the printing process works, but they were able to describe them, so we've got descriptions of the original. Um, and yeah, it shows Europe, Asia, and Libya, and um, this is Hecateus's version, and you can see how he added more rivers, and like, it was all about exploration of the world, um, where, like, obviously we've got this stuff now, but I find it quite interesting looking at it. And um, one thing I found really interesting was this continent of Libya, which is obviously Africa now. Um, it was originally the, um, the border was the Nile, but then, oh, can I get this name? Um, Herodotus, something like that. Um, he um, decided that it should be on the western coast or western side of um, ancient Egypt. So I find it fascinating that this is for continents, right? They're massive land masses. That's not for countries. Imagine how hard it must have been getting borders for countries before we had technology. It's just baffling to me. So now going on to visualization, anyone that knows anything about maps probably knows this one. Um, this is the most famous map of, um, especially the most famous medical map, or I, I'm not even going to say the word, I can't say it. <laughs> but um, it's Dr. John Snow's map of the London cholera outbreak. And basically there was a water pipe, or like a pump, which was contaminated. And he, no one knew what it was, and nobody knew how cholera works, because obviously it's seaborne and foodborne, but they didn't know that. So he put on a map all of the places that had deaths, and then was able to work out that it was right in the middle, and um, that solved the whole crisis. And that's um, Broad Street in London. So, yeah, I just... Now, 
I, I was thinking about taking this slide out, but I think it's fascinating. Um, it shows that not all maps have such positive outcomes. Um, this was a data visualization done by Jovan Chivik, I can't speak, um, <laughs> but of the Balkan Pilincia. Um, this was basically the map that caused Yugoslavia to split. Um, so this map, all, uh, now I don't know the politics and stuff, but according to the book that I mentioned earlier, it caused the war that um, after um, World War II, which, whichever way around it was. Um, and basically each ethnicity um, is in a different color or a different texture. So you can't really see it, but there's like um, slashes and there's um, hashes and things like that, which um, show like different races, different color, different um, religion and all of that. Um, so it's interesting, but obviously shows the downsides. Um, now, this isn't a map, this is a photo taken from the International Space Station with a 300, I think maybe 200 mil lens with just a Nikon DSLR. Um, like I've got a Canon that is longer than that and that's like a picture of an entire country. And I just find that fascinating that like the first maps I was showing were about looking, finding out how to do the geography of the world. And now we've got pictures of entire countries. And like we, we kind of know where the borders are now. So that's not our context. So that was their context. And like trying to figure out the point of maps for them was where the borders were. Now it's um, very different. So our focus is on like traffic. This is through London. The first, I, I did have a screenshot of, it was like, 2 a.m. and that was completely green so I thought I'd do it at midday and it's a bit more red so don't go to London especially not in a car um, but I think um, the other um, uses here are um, like you've got the quickest route to destination you've even got the ecosystem throughout the coast which is quite interesting and instead of looking I don't have a picture but instead of looking for um, where the coastline is you're like what's in the coastline and that's I find that fascinating but I think the key word is currently, because the context is real time. So let's move on from maps of antiquity to modern times. What are maps like now? And like we have computers. As web folk, we're likely to all encounter this map. This is the Google Analytics um, location map. I'm not sure if I should have this in, because this is one of my clients, but it's, it's got a nice figure. So it shows that um, what it's like to have people from all over the world. Um, and We've got both real-time data here and archived, which um, is really useful to people like us for working out um, like the research and what we should do. But it's not useful to like the other users. Um, whereas this map, um, that didn't change. This map is. This is a wind visualization. Um, it's done in cesium, so you can rotate it. I didn't rotate it. And I didn't want to do a live demo because it would break. Um, but yep, um, you can see how the wind moves. And this is, I think this was archived, but you can have real time as well. So you've got the wind speed and direction, but you could also show the location and magnitudes of earthquakes. Like Sally was saying, there's a lot of sensors um, that you can just use quite easily. And I will show a um, demo of that. And there's more scientific details, such as the chlorophyll in the um, sea, which is um, a project I worked on a couple of years ago, did a lot of that kind of um, data, basically grabbing all of the scientific data from the sea and putting it onto one map, which was fascinating and a really hard challenge, especially on the user interface, trying to make it something like you can like, say, I'm looking for this, but it's called something else for scientists, and I don't know what it is. Um, so that's an interesting challenge. Um, but where the ancient geographers used to use coastlines, we now rely on sensors all over the world and on satellites in space. Now, while I was developing this talk, I watched a few others to make sure I wasn't overlapping something that people had already said. And um, Aurelia Moser, I think that's how you pronounce her name, um, showed this map in one of her talks. And it's using CartoDB, which is where she works, um, showing the elevation in Iceland. And her point was that we can have beautiful maps. And I think this kind of like, proves my point as well. Like, we, it doesn't have to be just a basic map that all looks the same. Um, and this, especially when it zooms out, it just looks phenomenal. Um, I'll let that play through. Yeah, there you go. Like, that, that's data from a country, that's Iceland. And it just, it's, I, I really like that. 
And it's a proper slippy map. It's not a, it's not like a um, graphic. It's not been. It, it's made in the same way Google Maps is, so that you can move around, you can zoom in, and you've got different levels of zoom. Um, so that uses Ma Mapbox and Carta DB. Um, that map made me think of this one, which is my second favorite map ever. And this is a Japanese 1862 map of the Abe River region. And um, it's a watercolor map. And it shows where the hills are. Um, this is a very small crop, because it's a massive map. Um, and it's, I'd love to get a copy of that as well. It's really nice. Um, so there's that one. Um, and you can see the hills. They're not, they're not elevation levels like the um, Iceland one was. But they do show where the hills are and kind of how tall they were. And this is my favorite ever. Um, in the cartographer book, it goes over the whole page, and it just looks beautiful. It's off the Dagu River region in Colombia, and it's another watercolor. So it shows how the styling of the map, I don't know about you, but to me, I think that looks really nice. And if every map on the web looked like that, I wouldn't be up here. Um, but one interesting thing about this, and I don't know the re region, um, might just be because it's in Colombia, but the top is actually south, not north. So it doesn't really matter to us, but I found it interesting. Um, and obviously, that's in Latin, so I'm not reading that. Um, obvious, needed a picture. So <laughs> visualizing the wind and elevations is one extreme. But the other extreme is a single point on a map. Just one marker, um, possibly two, if you're really lucky. Um, because all businesses, um, and like if you're looking to get somewhere, you're not looking to visualize everything. You might not even need traffic. You just want to know where you're going. So I thought I'd take a look at um, how well, I thought I, my plan was to show you lots of maps from business websites and event websites, and then I just got really disappointed because they're all Google Maps, so I um, looked for ones that aren't. Um, so here's one from Eventbrite. This is a Google Map, but it's styled. So you've got the blue marker, um, and it's got a box that shows you the information. And it's, it's so simple. The only changes are like um, it's yellow, and it matches the color scheme of Eventbrite because Eventbrite's um, orange. So that works really nicely. And also, it, it, like with the interface, it's purpose for that website instead of one solution like Fitzall. Um, but it's just a customized version of Google Maps. It probably only took them an hour or two, maybe a bit longer, to test it. But it's um, not really hard. You don't have to be like the cleverest person in the world to do it. Um, now, I was planning to make fun of the from the front website, but that is beautiful. Um, especially when you've got the whole context of the web page, um, because it just, like, the branding is spot on, and there's not many other websites like that. Um, so, whoever the designer is, well done. It's really good. Um, and this is SVG, so it's not a slippy map. You can't zoom, um, but it shows you exactly how to get from here to the party, which is all you need to know, really, isn't it? So, yeah, that's perfect. It's got it, knows that I need a drink. <laughs> Right. Um, last Friday, I went to Deconstruct, and I don't know if you've seen their website, but it's one of my favorite on the web at the moment. It's very sci-fi, and um, it uses basically everything it can use, including customized maps. Um, so this map, I, now I think, well, it definitely uses Mapbox, but I think it's a um, slightly modified version of their high contrast um, base map, because it's slightly different to how um, their examples are on their website. Um, but they probably just selected the base map and maybe made a few modifications, and it fits the entire color scheme, and well, not the color scheme, but it fits the brand really well. Um, so I, I like that a lot. And um, also, it, it, kind of, it looks quite retro, so it fits the whole um, idea. Now, I will get into some code, um, but I kind of want to go over some of the techniques. Um, but the more I was writing, the more I was deleting slides, because I think um, a lot of them are better off for um, like article form rather than me just telling you how to do things. So this will be quite quick. Um, you've got markers. This is the one from Strava. Um, like Everybody's used a marker. It just <laughs> shows how to get from here to there. Um, and it's, it's all vector data or raw data. So you just say um, it's this latitude and longitude, and it's this latitude and longitude. And you say, like, fill up a, a dialog box or something like that if you want to. Um, and now this one is contours, basically exactly how the Iceland map works. Um, they're generally not raw data. I think the Iceland one was. 
No, actually, it probably wasn't. But um, they tend to use a, um, either server-side or in a middleware between the server and the website to generate images that are tiles, so that when you zoom in, the, the, the um, area that it shows is different. Um, same way the base map changes. Um, so that's used for large areas, um, and that works quite well. Um, Carl Pleth, this is actually a, um, quite an old screenshot from a project that I've been I just finished working on, um, so it was a year-long project for my thesis for, um, as Pierre was saying, my, I just finished my degree, and that was for that. Um, so that shows um, the postcode areas. It goes a lot smaller, but on, when you're zoomed out, it shows you the big postcode areas um, based on how good something is for, how, how likely it is for a place to be worth buying for a house for you specifically. specifically. So the pink shows the selected region, and the other colors um, are basically ranks. So um, that's discrete data. Um, so that, like, in one area, the only value is the value. There's no overlap. But then, obviously, you've got heat maps, which everybody kind of knows about, which is um, they're fuzzy. They can, like, you can say this area or this spot has this value, but the surrounding area will have similar values. So you could do pollution data, um, but where it gets less precise from the sensor. Um, this is an um, earthquake um, from open sensors that Sally was on about. Um, they have it for the whole world, but just for simple, um, I just did it from one single sensor or one sensor collection. Um, and yeah, so heat maps let you extrapolate the data from the radius of the data point. Um, and it's imprecise, I didn't mention that. Um, so it's clear to me that maps are perfect for data visualization, especially um, in the context of what we need. Um, so like I was saying, how will the map context change over time is really fascinating to me. But I thought I should probably do some code and stuff, because like, this is a technical conference, not a historical map conference. Um, <laughs> so how do we code them? Back to Google Analytics, because I found it quite funny that Google Analytics is one of the very few websites on the, basically the whole web that uses a map that isn't a Google map, because this is a Google chart. So it's an SVG, and you just throw it into um, Google's um, uh, their chart, uh, Google Charts is what it's called, and it produces an SVG. Um, and you get that by loading the visualization library from the Google's JS API library loader. Um, so that's kind of how it's done. Actually, I think I probably stole that straight from their website, because I very rarely do anything without copy and pasting when it's for this kind of thing. Um, so to create a map like that, we, um, you just load the library, um, and then you say you want a um, Google ch a geo chart, because if you put a map, then it is an actual Google map. But this is just an SVG. Um, and it's not a slippy map or anything like that, but you can tend to click on one area and it'll zoom in to like, basically generate a new SVG for you. Um, now, I was going to do a whole thing about how projections work, um, but you probably learned it at school, and it's also really complicated. And my maths is good, but it's not that good. Um, so basically, all you need to know is these two are the main ones. Um, most um, mapping libraries have them built in. The first one, um, EPSG4326, is a geographic coordinate system. So that's um, kind of um, latitude and longitude of the actual world, whereas EPSG 3857 yep, is the projected coordinates. So that's more like Cartesian coordinates where you've got the um, like x, y axis. And they are relative, but they're not the same numbers. So you've got a transform between them, which is the majority of the code when you're doing very simple demos, like the one I'm about to show, is that you're just transforming the data. Um, so yeah, quite often you need to transform the data. This is, it should be a video. Is this a video? I mm, don't look like it. Might not be a video. Oh no, this is the origin. So you can see how over here, um, that it's at zero, zero. That's because it's not been projected yet. Um, every time I go to make a new map, I end up at zero, zero, and I think, I, like, why am I here? But it's always the same problem. Um, so, yep, there's that. I just put in this slide because I thought it was quite interesting because if you don't do maps, then you probably don't know about it. If you do, you've probably stumbled upon it every time. Um, and the main difference between um, all of these maps I showed, especially with deconstruct and that kind of thing, is that they, it's just the styles. You don't need to like um, 
make the roads or anything like that. You just get the data and decide what kind of base map you want for it. So you can use satellite. You could you, there's like sketch ones. There's um, lots of different. This is from Mapbox, I think. Um, and with Mapbox, you can actually style using CSS-ish. It's not real CSS, but it's like CSS. So you can go label color is red, and it'll make all of the labels red. So that's amazing. Um, but I, I think I talk about more of that at the end. So <laughs> uh, I just put that one in as well. Um, if you're dealing with raw data, then um, you'll be using a data type such as GeoJSON, which is the one on the right. Um, KML, well-known text, or shapefiles. They're the main four that I tend to use. Um, they're a bit daunting at first, because like, this is a tiny um, example. This is just the earthquakes. Um, but if you're doing like, massive polygons or lo loads of data, then it soon adds up. Um, and if, you've not, if you're not used to big XML files or JSON files, then it's a bit scary. Um, but the hard bit tends to, well, not hard bit, but usually um, sensors um, such as the Open Sensors uh, one um, doesn't, I don't know why, but I can't find a way of exporting to GeoJSON or any of the others. So they just send a response, which you need to just create a parser for. And that tends to be the majority of the code. Like um, the, when I showed the choropleths of um, the postcodes, um, about over a thousand lines of that code was just parsing various um, libraries and various um, data sources. So that tends to be the bit that takes the time. Um, the, here's the video, found it. This is, um, it uses OpenLayers 3, which is, I love. It's so much better than OpenLayers 2. It's, it's fast. Um, but the, it's, yeah, it's the earthquakes from the European Mediterranean Seismological Center via um, open sensors. Um, and there was an issue with this, because this uses the archive data, because I thought the likelihood of me being on stage at the same time there's an earthquake is unlikely, and I don't want that to happen. So I used archive data. Um, but there was a bug with open sensors, so I sent an email saying, oh, look, there's a bug with, your, um, with the Ajax, and it was fixed almost immediately. So they're really good. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of code to do this. Obviously, it's quite simple anyway, but it's not something that we tend to do, um, so I found it quite interesting. I say we, like most of my projects tend to do this, but <laughs> it never used to. Um, so we start by importing a base map. Um, this one comes from MapQuest, which I think AOL own, but I might be wrong. So they just have a tile server. You can set up your own tile server, but that's way above the level that I'm talking about here. Um, and it uses a satellite base map um, from, you know, from their tile server. Um, you can get like models of the Earth as well, so that it's not, it doesn't have like all the um, pixelization, really, that um, a satellite image does. And then um, here we create the object as a map. We say target map where the target is the ID. So it's like um, a div with the ID of map. Um, I thought there's no point showing HTML because all of you know HTML, I expect. So <laughs> there's no point doing that. Um, and then we just import the raster um, variable, which we made the tile map um, into layers. And then we do this transform bit, which I mentioned earlier, um, where we transform from one to the other. Um, which and then you got this uh, you center it at 2040, which is about the Mediterranean ish. Um, and here is the Ajax call. I use JavaScript just because not JavaScript, jQuery, just because it's really simple, but you don't need to. Um, and you set, go give the URL and for open sense, it says you need to give an API key. You don't for all, you don't have to for all of them. Um, and then it just, this is for the GNC. And then um, I've got a success function called add data, which basically it, no, this is past year. <laughs> so add data basically just calls past geo so that it takes a response and turns it into the geo JSON, which um, we can just, I won't go through that, it's just, fairly basic, just parsing, um, going through each line by line, and then taking out the data that's needed. I don't take out the magnitude here, just because it wouldn't fit on the page. But if you wanted to add magnitude, it's just like it's just a bit extra. And then you get bigger heat maps or heat spots. And also, that normally that's done in middleware. But obviously, I did it on client side, just to make it easier. Um, and then you import the heat map um, with the parse geo, which I mentioned there, that's, yeah, and the features projection, so that you're in the right projection. Um, I should have just put this all up on GitHub and like cut out this section. Very well. 
Um, so this is an extremely simple version, but once you get um, the points shown on the map, you can do some really quite advanced things. Like you can show the magnitude, but you can um, like you could add an interface that lets you search all of the earthquakes ever, that kind of thing. And it's not that much extra because like just setting up the map is like the important bit, and it's fairly easy. Um, so the heat maps. Um, are very useful for um, instead of markers because obviously this is this basically using heat maps as markers, but for normal heat maps you have the magnitudes of the earthquake so, so that one area would be a lot more red. Um, so the web's is synonymous. I can't say that word. I told you I can't speak English. Um, with um, the internet for many people, but it's not the case. You can have websites offline, and it's starting to happen a lot more. Um, so you can use, um, you can essentially cache each API call, including image tiles, using Service Worker, which isn't like out yet. You can kind of get it in Chrome, but um, and there are polyfills. But this is like in the next year or two, maybe less. Um, and then you can have like the best thing about Google Maps, the application, is that you can use a map anywhere. And like I've been walking around here with our internet, and it's worked. And that will work with um, maps on the web as well. Um, and I presume most of these libraries probably add them in by default soon, so that'd be good. Um, and while offline's a little time away yet, um, real-time updates are right here. So we can use Ajax calls with a polling, or we can use WebRTC, or we can use um, WebSockets to have a real-time connection um, with the API so that you can update like see all of the visualizations for whether it's the whole of the Earth or um, for the traffic, um, you can do that as well. Um, looking at the time, I just skipped through this a bit, but um, these are basically some of the tools because like this isn't an ad for open layers and it's not that map uh, ad for <laughs> Google Maps either. But um, there's Leaflet, which is basically um, like the lightweight. Um, if you don't want to use Google Maps, use Leaflet kind of thing. It's just you kind of plonk it in, and um, you can choose which base map quite easily. Um, you just like this one uses OpenStreetMap, and I should enforce you can do styled maps in Google. Um, I think I missed out the slide, but you like you you can change the colors. And um, Donald Sutherland, I think, um, has Map Builder without the e on the end. Um, dot probably com. I'm not sure. You have to Google it, but um, that lets you make really easy Google Maps, um, which are styled and aren't the same as like the default Google Maps. Um, and this uses uh, ZXY, which now I need to. Point Point out on camera. I don't know where the camera is, but in the 24 Ways article, I made a mistake saying you shouldn't use ZXY. Um, that's only for data. This is for base map, so you should like you should use it because otherwise it's, it's just weird not to. So that was a mistake that I'm hoping to um, repent myself for. <laughs> I've had a lot of emails from like the geo community because um, there's not like, much overlap between the web and geo communities, but they're like they're as big as each other in their own right. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of um, emails. Um, and you can see that you can easily change the attribution at the bottom, which is the label. Um, and that's just a string, which is quite cool. Um, I spoke about Open Layers. Open Layers 3 has WebGL, and it's really fast. Um, and you've got full access to the map controls. So if you want to create a complete new interface, it's quite simple too, which is probably like if you're making a like GIS tool or something, yeah, Open Layers is one of your best bets. Um, I love Visi Cities. Um, it's really alpha, before alpha still, but it's been going for about two years now. And I used it for the thesis work I did. And it's a 3D map from kind of like a plane level. So if you've ever played SimCity, it's basically that. Um, and you can it uses OpenStreetMap for the background, but you can change anything. And like they've done like the London Underground, they've done planes, um, so it can be used for anything in Earth in 3D kind of thing. And it's by Robin Hawkes, and he's done a great job. Um, Cesium is kind of the opposite of Visi Cities. So where Visi Cities is like going over that, like like a plane, it's um, Cesium's more having the globe, and you can kind of turn it and zoom into it, that kind of thing. So on their main page, they've got the International Space Station going over, um, and that's in real time, 3D, which is cool. 
Um, there's Mapbox, which I've mentioned a lot. They are a business, so it's not like an open source library, but they do have open source elements. And they've got some free tools such as um, Mapbox Studio, which is the one that lets you do the CSS, which I think I've got, yeah, I've got on the next slide. Um, that doesn't quite show the CSS, but um, like you can change each of the colors using basically that. Um, and you can target zoom levels so that like, if you want only some labels to appear in one context and not the other, then that will show. Um, and they've got an online editor, which doesn't do as much, but it's pretty cool. That's like a pencil sketch. And like, the C's got wiggles, which I like. Um, so I drew a map. Um, this isn't as good as the earthquake one, but it kind of shows um, how we went from the start um, through talking about maps, through to the history and what maps are and why they like, can be really beautiful. Um, and then we found out that data is really important and like, um, we should be using that. Um, and then um, it's um, how we use them. Um, but I think the most important takeaway, and this is probably going to be quite um, tacky, but I think it's um, context. And that's where the party is later. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much.